Hello, I'm Neil Ampel. I'm a professor emeritus of medicine and immunobiology at the University of Arizona College of Medicine. Today I'm going to talk about the epidemiology, clinical presentation, and diagnosis of coccidioidomycosis. Our intended learning outcomes today are to understand how and where coccidioidomycosis is acquired, to be familiar with common clinical manifestations of coccidioidomycosis, and to understand how to diagnose coccidioidomycosis. By way of introduction, coccidioidomycosis is caused by two closely related species, coccidioides imidis and coccidioides posidaceae. These are not distinguishable in clinical laboratories or by their clinical presentation. Infections are found in certain regions of only the Western Hemisphere. Fungi live in uncultivated soil, but the precise sites are not well defined. Fungal spores, called arthrocnidia, are released into the air, and most infections occur when these spores are inhaled by a susceptible host. A single arthrocnidium may be infectious. 60% of infections are completely without symptoms, 40% result in a pneumonia syndrome, and most cases result in lifelong immunity to further infection. However, in a small number of cases, infection is not controlled and manifests outside the thoracic cavity. This has been called extrathoracic disseminated disease. For an overview, the endemic areas are only in the Western Hemisphere. The major mode of transmission is inhalation with very rare cases of inoculation. So the primary site of infection in almost all cases is the lung. When extrathoracic dissemination occurs, the most common places are skin, soft tissue, bone and joints, and meninges. The arthrocnidium is the environmental phase of the fungus it is a 2 by 5 micron barrel shaped spore that can remain airborne for prolonged periods. In the host, the fungus morpho morphologically changes to a spherule, which can be from 5 to 120 micrometers and contains small endospores. Historically, Coccidioides mycosis was first described in the 1890s, initially in an Argentinian soldier by the medical student Alejandro Posadas. It was subsequently noted in the San Joaquin Valley of California. In the 1900s, it was considered to be a protozoan infection until Ophuls cultured it. In the 1930s, it was described as a benign pulmonary illness called San Joaquin Valley Fever. In the 40s and 50s, Smith performed epidemiologic studies in the San Joaquin Valley and determined that 60% of infections were asymptomatic and also that African-American men appeared to be at increased risk for severe disease. The first treatment was developed in the 1960s and this was amphotericin B. Between 1960 and 1990s, Papagianis followed Smith and developed an improved serologic testing. In the 1980s and 90s, opportunistic infections were described in those with HIV-1 infection and solid organ transplants. Triazole antifungals began to be used for treatment of coccidioidomycosis in the 1990s, including for meningitis. In the 2000s, Fisher and Taylor noted that there were two genetic species, C. imidis and C. posidaceae, and since then we have noted that the epidemiologic regions may have expanded, particularly to eastern Washington state and northeastern Utah. As mentioned, autochthonous infection is only found in the western hemisphere and the fungus is particularly endemic in the southwestern United States, the San Joaquin Valley of California, and northern Mexico. Other endemic regions include parts of Central America and South America, 
particularly northeast Brazil and northern Argentina. In areas where the fungus is endemic, it may account for up to 25% of community-acquired pneumonia. In the past, case reports and skin test studies have defined the endemic area. As mentioned, there's been recent identification of endemicity in eastern Washington and northeastern Utah. High-risk groups for coccidioidomycosis include persons with suppressed cellular immunity, including HIV-1 infection, solid organ transplantation, immunomodulator therapy, cancer chemotherapy, and long-term corticosteroid use. Some individuals with African ancestry genes appear to be at high risk for severe and disseminated disease, and that may also apply to those with Filipino background. Although infection is less severe in women and young persons, acquisition during the second trimester and later in pregnant women may lead to severe and disseminated disease. The fungus resides in uncultivated soil, but its precise niche is not established, but it may be concentrated in animal burrows. In addition, rodents may serve as a reservoir. The mycelial form becomes airborne and inhaled by a susceptible host. After inhalation, the fungus enters its host phase. There is initially a neutrophilic and subsequently a monocytic cellular immune response. Control of infection is developed on a robust cellular immune response and is manifested in tissue by a necrotizing granuloma. Most infections become latent with the fungus remaining viable but inactive. Some infections may cause local pulmonary problems such as nodules or cavities, and a smaller number of individuals develop disease outside the thoracic cavity, extrathoracic dissemination. This manifestation is usually associated with a lack of cell cellular immune response and persistent disease activity unless treated with an antifungal. This cartoon displays the life cycle of the fungus. In the soil environment, the fungus exists as mycelia with alternating cell degeneration. Aerial mycelia develop and viable cells between the degenerate cells can dislodge and become airborne. These are the arthroconidia. When inhaled by a susceptible host, they undergo a profound morphogenesis by enlarging and rounding up and forming a spherule, which may grow to 120 microns in diameter. Spherules may rupture, releasing packets of endospores, which continue the host life cycle. If the fungus returns to the soil environment, it will revert to its mycelial form. The majority of infections, 60%, are completely asymptomatic. An additional 40% present with pneumonia, and that's termed primary pulmonary coccidioidomycosis. This is often misdiagnosed as a bacterial community acquired pneumonia, but it may be clinically distinguished by pulmonary infiltrates in the, left, in the upper lobe that are often dense and associated with hyalur or mediastinal adenopathy. The patient may have night sweats and fatigue and particular rashes, including erythema nodosum, erythema multiforme, toxic erythema, and sweet syndrome. The patient may also develop symmetric arthralgias known as desert rheumatism. Pulmonary sequelae include nodules, cavities, pyonumotherax, and chronic pulmonary disease, which is uncommon. This slide demonstrates the frequency of the various manifestations of coccidioidomycosis. 60% asymptomatic, 40% symptomatic pneumonia. 95% will recover with lifelong immunity. Approximately four may develop chronic pulmonary sequelae, and one out of 100 may develop extrathoracic dissemination.
The x-ray on the left demonstrates a typical coccidiodal pneumonia in the right upper lobe, lobe associated with hyalur adenopathy. On the right is a patient with erythema nodosum as part of their primary pulmonary coccidioidomycosis. Disseminated disease is the presence of infection outside the thoracic cavity. Spherules present on pathology or coccidioides grows from this site. This is distinct from the cutaneous immunological events of primary pneumonia. Such dissemination usually occurs within six months of primary pulmonary infection, but may occur after a longer period of time if antifungal therapy is used during primary infection. Pulmonary infection may or may not be apparent at the time of dissemination. The most common sites of dissemination include skin and soft tissue, bone and joints, meninges, and occasionally prostate and epididymis. The differential diagnosis of coccidioidomycosis is broad. Pulmonary pneumonia may be confused with a bacterial process. A pulmonary nodule may be confused with carcinoma of the lung. Nodules may also be confused with other fungal illnesses such as aspergillosis or cryptococcosis. Chronic cavitary coccidioidomycosis may look like tuberculosis, non-tuberculous mycobacterial infection, histoplasmosis, blastomycosis, or chronic cavitary pulmonary aspergillosis. Meningitis due to coccidioidomycosis may be confused with tuberculous meningitis or aseptic meningitis. The skin may appear as a common wart or bacterial cellulitis, and bone may appear to be a bacterial osteomyelitis. Imaging is an essential tool for diagnosing coccidioidomycosis. It's needed for diagnosis, prognosis, and follow-up, and assisting in determining if extrathoracic dissemination is present. The most commonly used modalities include plain chest x-ray, CT scan with and without contrast, and MRI generally with gadolinium. Ancillary imaging methods include bone scan and PET CT. Common imaging findings include on plain chest x ray, a dense nodule or often upper lobe infiltrate that may subsequently cavitate. On CT scan, satellite micronodules surrounding an area of a main nodule may be seen, as well as hyalur and mediastinal adenopathy. For CNS disease, MRI with gadolinium frequently reveals basal or meningeal enhancement. PET-CT may be helpful, but does not distinguish cancer from coccidioidal nodules. Laboratory diagnosis can depend on direct microscopy, usually performed on respiratory samples. A time-honored technique is using potassium hydroxide at 10 or 20 percent. Calculus for a white can also be used. Both of these methods have a low sensitivity. Culture can be useful in diagnosing coccidioidomycosis. The fungus grows on a variety of media, including blood auger, and growth is detectable in a fairly short period of time, from two to 10 days. However, this is a major laboratory hazard, so the laboratory should be alerted if you're thinking of coccidioidomycosis, and the plate should remain covered and sealed. Pathology, pathological examination can be done on nearly any tissue, Gimsa, hematoxylin, eosin will demonstrate spherules, and these are much better seen with silver stains such as the Gomori methenamine technique.
Serology with antibody testing remains the mainstay of diagnosis, and that's how most cases are defined and confirmed. Tests are generally only positive during active disease and are not useful during latent infection. Two antibodies are found, the IgM, which is directed against a fungal glucosidase, which is heat stable. It is positive in early disease and occasionally in reactivation. It is not prognostic, nor is it titratable. IgG is directed against fungal chitinase and is heat labile. It is positive a few weeks after the IgM. It can be titrated and give a quantitative result and therefore is used for prognostication. It is also useful in diagnosing coccidioidal meningitis. The specific in tests include the pers two precipitin test, which is an analog for IgM antibody. In the traditional test, it's a button found on the bottom of the tube after incubation with heat-stable antigen. It's currently rarely performed as such and has been replaced by immunodiffusion. Complement fixation is still done by several specialty laboratories. It depends on the innovation of lysis of foreign red blood cells when incubated with heat label antigen preparation, indicating the presence of IgG antibody. It can be titrated in two-fold dilutions. Markedly elevated titers, for example, greater than 1 to 32, are suggestive of more severe and possibly extrathoracic disseminated disease. Titers decline with control of infection, either with antifungal therapy or naturally. Occasionally, a true CF test may not be interpretable because the serum is anti-complementary and no result will be obtained. Most commonly used are the enzyme immunoassay or EIA tests. These consist of EIA IgM and EIA IgG. They are both very sensitive and generally the results are available in less than 72 hours. Neither test is prognostic and in fact both may persist for months to years. There are occasional false positives, most likely with the IgM. However, if one or both tests are positive with the appropriate clinical syndrome, this is highly suggestive of coccidioidomycosis. When either an when EIA tests are positive, they should be confirmed by immunodiffusion testing. In this test, wells in the center of an auger plate are filled with antigen preparation, and wells in the periphery of the plate are filled with a serum to be tested or a control. The plate is incubated to allow diffusion of both antigen and antibody through the auger. If antibody is present, a line of identity will appear where antigen and antibody cross, as seen in the figure. There are two tests, the immunodiffusion 2 precipitin, which measures IgM, and the immunodiffusion complement fixation, which measures IgG. The latter test can be quantitated, and that is called the quantitative immunodiffusion, or QID, and titers, just like in the true complement fixation test, can be derived in one to two steps. This test can be used when the true CF test is anti-complementary. Other diagnostic methods include PCR. This test is useful where available. It is as sensitive as culture, but results may be available sooner. There's also a commercially available antigen test. It detects coccidioidal galactomannan. It may cross-react with other fungal galactomannans, particularly hist from histoplasma capsulatum. Both urine and serum can be used. It is generally only positive in severe disseminated cases, but may have usefulness in diagnosing coccidioidal meningitis when antigen is detected in the CSF. 
And finally, the nonspecific 1,3-beta D-glucan test may be used. It's often but not invariably positive in coccidioidomycosis and is not specific. So if more specific tests are available, those should be used in lieu of the beta D glucan test. In summary, coccidioidomycosis is a common infection within the endemic regions, which are expanding. Most infections are clinically inapparent and result in long-lived immunity to reinfection. In some cases, coccidioidomycosis presents as a community-acquired pneumonia that can be difficult to distinguish from a bacterial infection. In a small number of cases, infection spreads outside the thoracic cavity, and this is called extrathoracic dissemination. Diagnosis is based on clinical acumen and then by obtaining coccidioidal serology and or growing the causative organism or seeing spherules on pathological examination. These are some additional references. Thank you.